Howard Dean Burton Sr., 87, of Arapahoe and formerly of Bingham, Nebraska, passed away peacefully on Thursday, June 4, 2015, in the Good Samaritan Hospital in Kearney. Howard was born October 22, 1927, in Alliance, Nebraska, to Charles and Ida Gray Burton. He was the oldest of seven children. He grew up on the family ranch and attended high school in Curtis, Nebraska, graduating in 1945. He attended the University of Nebraska at Lincoln before being drafted into the Army. Howard served from November of 1950 through October of 1952. After his honorable discharge, he returned to the family ranch. On April 10, 1953, Howard was united in marriage to Helen Schwaterer in Alliance. To this union, four children were born, Jean, Jim, Howard II, and Dina. Howard continued to ranch with his father, managing the family business in Ray, Colorado for many years. The family returned to Bingham, Nebraska, where Howard worked the ranch for the remainder of his work career. He loved the Nebraska sandhills, the cattle, and the horses. In August 2014, Howard moved to Arapahoe to live near his daughter, where he was known in the community as the Gator Man, as he drove his John Deere Gator around town to do his shopping and his visiting. Preceding him, death, preceding him in death were his wife Helen, daughter Dina Wormsman, his parents, three brothers, and a sister. Survivors include three sons, Gene and wife Jane Burton of Norton, Kansas, Jim and wife Peggy Burton of Grant, and Howard II and wife Mary Burton of Mesa, Arizona, son-in-law Jeff Wormsman of Arapahoe, two sisters, Ima and husband Keith Hodges of Bingham, and Pauline Pruitt of Camp Verde, Arizona. Also, ten grandchildren, Jeffrey and wife Angela Burton, Eric and wife Jenny Burton, Patrick Burton, Megan and husband Dusty Marquardt, Leslie and, Zach we and husband Zach West, Howard III and wife Jamie Burton, Kevin Burton, Christine Burton, Austin Wordsman, and Tanner Wordsman, and ten great-grandchildren, Annika, Xavier, Tegan, Maisie, Alex, Ethan, Jake, Luke, Easton, and Lily, and many nieces and nephews. Let us pray. Father, we're gathered here this morning because of something none of us likes to consider, death. Somebody we love, somebody we cared for, is no longer with us. And Lord, I just pray now that this service would bring comfort to the family and the friends. I pray, Lord, that the truth of Jesus and what he has done for us through his death and resurrection would bring both comfort and a challenge to those of us who remain. Father, I do pray for the family, especially at this time, as they mourn the loss of their dad, their uncle, their grandpa, their great-grandpa, that you would comfort them as only you can, that they would sense your special, special presence during this time. And most of all, Father, we pray that you would be honored and glorified through what is said and done here this day. In Jesus' great name we pray. Amen.
scripture readings this morning are fairly familiar to most of you, I'm sure. And I say this every time I read them, but I think it's important. The reason they're familiar, the reason they're used is because of their significance. Because of the truth that they teach. And it's truth that we need at times like this. Not feelings or emotions, but we need truth to help us deal with these difficult issues. So we'll begin with the 23rd Psalm. Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And then in the New Testament, the Gospel of John, John chapter 14, this is a passage where Jesus is at the Last Supper. He knows that these uh, 12 guys are all going to desert him. One of them has already betrayed him. He knows that these guys, his friends for the last three years, at his hour of greatest need, will run for their lives and leave him totally alone. And this is what he says to these guys. And, and it's clear that all he can think about is their needs, not his needs. And it's really an amazing testimony to the fact that Christ focused completely on us and not on himself. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, I did not know Howard Burton. In fact, the reason I am standing up here today is because I know Jim. And I know Jim because for many, many years I helped coach the Ogallala Legion team, and Jim was an umpire that regularly umpired our games. And all I can say is I hope Howard had better eyesight than Jim did. <laughs> Actually, though, Jim was good up. Huh? Um, we did enjoy having him, and I can honestly say that when... Uh, we knew that he was umping. It, it gave us some peace. There were many arguments with him. He always ended up being right. Is that the way it is? Well, that's kind of nice to know. But you're not here to talk about baseball or, or Jim's umpiring capability. We're here to remember Howard Burton. Now, when you read an obituary of a man like Howard Burton, one of the things that you immediately notice is all of the clubs and civic activities and things that he never did. Some people would read an obituary like that and say, well, what are you in his life? That his life really counts. I actually think that Howard Burton, and although I've never met the man, is the kind of guy that this country was great because of. I think when you think about Howard Burton and his life, the fact that he grew up and learned to work hard, that he went to school, got as much education as he could, served his country in a very unpopular war, not as unpopular as Vietnam, but certainly not popular, probably saw some horrific stuff that couldn't even talk about, comes back, marries, raises four children, works hard his entire life, is there for his kids, is there for his wife, honest, faithful. That's the kind of stuff that great nations are built on. And that's the kind of stuff, sadly, we don't see a lot of anymore. So was Howard Burton a great civic leader? No. Was Howard super involved in his community? No. He was just a great man. A great man because he was honest, he was faithful, worked hard, he took care of his family, and he taught them to be the same kind of people. I think there's something much more important to talk about than the life of an individual. And that's the whole reality of death. We're all here today because somebody died. We wouldn't be here together. We wouldn't have gathered together just to gather together. We wouldn't have also, somebody wouldn't have gotten to the and said, hey, why don't we just all get together? So what's for? Well, we're here because a tragedy happens. Somebody we know, somebody we love has died. And one of the reasons we don't like to gather other than we're reminded of we're going to miss somebody is it reminds us of our own mortality. 
It reminds us of something we don't like to think about, and that is one day we too are going to die. And that's fact, it's true, but it's something we all tend to push away, don't we? In the Bible, in Ecclesiastes, it says God has placed eternity in the hearts of men. And what that means is everybody knows that this life is not the end. Everybody knows deep down inside that when they die, they actually will continue living in one place or another. Now, we don't like to think about that because we don't like that other place. And, of course, a lot of people today say, well, you know, I don't believe in God or, you know, hell can't be a real place. And so we, we say those things because we don't want to have to deal with the reality that one day we're going to stand before God. And we really do want to make sure that we go to heaven. And by denying them, maybe they aren't really true. But down inside, deep inside, because God has placed eternity in our hearts, we know that this life is but a breath. And that eternity is forever and ever and ever. And Jesus says you can know where you're going to spend eternity in this life. In fact, you decide in this life where you spend eternity. This passage that I just read from John chapter 14, he's telling the disciples that he's prepared a place for them in his house in heaven. And he says, I'm going there to get it all ready for you and that, because I want you to live in my house forever and ever and ever. And that's what we all want. We all want to live in God's house, don't we? Forever and ever and ever. And then Jesus says something that's absolutely amazing. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, everybody acknowledges, I, in fact, I've never heard anybody deny this truth, that Jesus is a great man, some people say the greatest, and the greatest teacher of all time. Now, if he's such a great man and a great teacher, what is he teaching here? He's saying he is the way. Okay, he's the way to heaven. He says he is truth. Truth, Jesus is the embodiment of truth. He determines what truth is. He is the fountain from which all truth flows. So he decides what is true and what is false. I don't get to decide that. You don't get to decide that. Although we live in a culture today that likes to think we get to decide that. But one of these days we're going to find out that it's just not true. Jesus decides what is truth and what is false. I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you don't have Jesus, you don't have real life. Or you might have life, you might be having a lot of fun, but you don't have the life that you were made to have. You aren't fulfilled, you don't have the purpose that God meant for you to have. And then last of all, he says, no one comes to the Father except through me. And that's an absolute statement. Of course, we don't like absolutes today. But Jesus is saying the only way to heaven is through me. Now what does he mean through him? Well, Jesus came to die on the cross. The reason he died on the cross was because we are sinners and our sin separates us from God. And in order for God to forgive us, he had to punish our sin. And with Jesus dying on the cross, God is punishing the human race's sin in Jesus Christ so that God can forgive our sin. And so when we put our trust in Christ to provide forgiveness for our sins, we are forgiven. Not because we're good people, not because we deserve it, not because we earned it, but because Jesus' death and resurrection satisfies God's justice and God's wrath. And so Jesus is telling us here that He is the way, the truth, and the life, and the only way to the Father is through Him. And so every one of us has to make a decision in this life, are we going to trust what Jesus did for us, or are we going to try and do it on our own? Now, numerous times in Jesus' ministry, he said, I just want you guys to know, uh, this is a loose paraphrase, by the way, that um, I'm going to die, and three days later, I'm going to be raised from the dead, and this will prove that what I teach is true, and who I claim to be is true. Now, folks, Jesus said he was God in the flesh, and Jesus said he is the only way to heaven. And then he actually did die, and three days later, he was raised from the dead. He pulled it off. And so I would say that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. And that all of us here, if we've trusted Christ as our own personal Savior and Lord, can know that when we die, we'll spend eternity in heaven. And every person in this room knows about eternity. You may say you don't like it. It doesn't matter whether you like it or not. It is. And so my challenge for all of us today is this. Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior and Lord? One day, a bunch of people are going to gather because you died. Are you ready for that day? Have you trusted Christ? Because only Christ can provide forgiveness of our sins. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for the death and resurrection of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that you are willing to send your one and only Son 
to come into this world to die in our place so that we could be forgiven. I thank you, God, for the hope that we have through faith in Christ. The certainty that those of us who have trusted Christ as our Savior and Lord, we, we know that when we die, we'll be in heaven with you forever and ever and ever. And we thank you so much, Father, for that truth. Father, I thank you for Howard Burton and his life. I thank you for the example that he set. I thank you, Lord, that maybe society wouldn't say he was a great man, but I think you would. I thank you, Lord, that he was reliable, that he was honest, that he was faithful, that he worked hard. Lord, I thank you that everybody that knew him was privileged to know him. I thank you that those that were part of his family were honored to be able to call him dad, uncle, grandpa, great-grandpa, because of what he taught him and what he meant to them. Lord, I just pray they could cherish those memories of Howard. Lord, more importantly than that, though, I pray that none of us would leave this place today without making sure we have trusted in the one and only way to heaven, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's in His great name we pray. Amen. <coughs> May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Okay. Yeah, that's better. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Right through that door, right there.